So kicking off first, we have the fabulous Natalie Griffiths, who is owner of Space PR. Natalie is a bit of a launch veteran here. She is so involved in everything we do, and it really means a lot to us because she has such a heart and passion for the indie dev scene. And there are so many connections she knows and information this woman knows. Like, if you need to make, you need to talk to her. She just knows so many people. So it's really great to have her with us. Um, she, let's just give read a bit of a background about her. So in um, 2000, she made the move to the dark side after working in publishing um, and estab uh, dark side to establish the PR marketing team and lead developer at Blitz Game Studios for 12 years and handled everything from internal comms to corporate PR and business development, product launches and tech licensing, as well as leading the studio's respected education outreach program. In 2013, she ran her own PR agency, Pressspace, which has been dedicated to supporting the promotional and training needs of indies and startups. She has recently jo joined forces with another well-respected decibel PR. If you want to give us a wave, yeah. hi. <laughs> um, to offer a shared PR process that allows smaller studios the opportunity to benefit from a combined experience of over 30 years in games PR without the price tag of a larger agency. So without further ado, Natalie. Oh, we've got an interesting screensaver going on. Okay, thanks, Pia. Um, so yeah, we're going to talk about building something out of nothing. That's the slightly less succinct version of what the talk's about. Um, how to build a passionate community of fans from scratch by telling great stories, using social media events, and really, really good content. So who am I? Well, why am I qualified to talk about this stuff? Well, Pia's given a bit of background. Um, and also for the last 18 months or more, I've been working with an indie startup in Hammersmith called Payload. And they've been working on a really cool um, modular vehicle creation and combat game called TerraTech. Um, and they've been committed to kind of developing the game in the public eye and working with the community right from the beginning. Um, when I first started working with them, say well over 18 months ago now, I was actually the first person that they took on before they hired other freelancers to actually develop the prototype for the game. The second person they took on was our first community manager. That's how committed they've been to approaching development in that way. Um, I've going to go through some of the techniques that we've used together over the last 18 months to try and get people excited about the game to build that community. Um, successful Kickstarter campaign, they've supported us on our closed and our open beta and most recently our early access launch um, and we're working towards a, a 1.0 launch of the game in the autumn on Steam. So if anybody wants a code for TerraTech um, to check out the early access version then the first five people that come and ask me an intelligent question during the course of the day about NDPR will get one of those codes. Um, so yeah, I mean, be between mass over 1,000 downloads of the demo, um, we're now heading for, I think it's 350,000 unique views on our Twitch channel. We raised 40,000 pounds on Kickstarter with a target of 35. Um, and that's with very little actual conventional press coverage. It's all been mostly driven by the community. Um, the last six or seven months, I've also been working with another startup based in Leamington called Radiant Worlds, who were formed by, um, and run by former Blitz Games bosses. Um, they're working on a game on a much bigger scale um, called Sky Saga. Um, instead of the nine or 10 people that we have for Payload Studios, they've got 70 or 80. They've got a very well-funded Korean publisher. Um, and on the surface, they couldn't be more different. But actually what we're trying to achieve is exactly the same thing. We're building an original IP from scratch using the community to help do that. So I think it's, it's important to kind of see that these things are achievable on a small indie scale, just as much as they are on a, on a larger scale. And what's been interesting in this case is that actually the lessons we learned doing this on a shoestring um, for an indie developer have paid dividends on the larger scale with Radiant Worlds as well. So I'm hoping that because you're all here today, I'm already preaching to the this is important, um, but I quite often peop find people thinking that community and PR stuff is pointless or too difficult or like why do we need to bother with all that it all sounds like too much work um in my experience most of these people tend to be either blindly optimistic or blindly pessimistic about stuff um so we get things like well you know i'll get onto steam and then that'll, that'll be fine it'll be good or i know let's do a kickstarter because that's nice free easy pr or well it's all about youtube isn't it so i'll just i'll just email pewdiepie and then you know we'll be fine 
or on the slightly more cynical side, you have, it's not about how good the game is, or that kind of thing. It's all about who you know and having those connections. Or, you know, oh, well, he only got successful because he was really lucky. Well, is there any truth in any of that stuff? Yeah, not so much. But that doesn't mean that it's not really, really hard work. So why should we bother? Well, hopefully, as I say, I'm preaching to the choir and you guys understand that it's important. But to address some of those things, um, I think there was there was possibly a golden age of Steam, maybe, for a few people. Um, five, six years ago, where actually simply getting on Steam was enough to be successful. Um, but it's increasingly turning into the App Store in terms of being a discoverability nightmare. You've got to point people to your game on Steam or you're just not going to get anywhere with it. In terms of Kickstarter, I'm a big fan of Kickstarter for the right projects, but never be under any illusion that it's easy or free in any respect in terms of free publicity, free money, creative freedom. It's not. It's an enormous amount of work. It can work brilliantly for some projects, but don't think that's an easy fast track to provide the momentum from that for however long afterwards to sell your game. And yes, YouTube is super important, but the big guys make, to make decisions on what they're going to cover on their channels based on are covering. Likewise, they make a decision based on the tiers below them, and they all they all watch what bubbles up from the bottom. So you need to be kind of subscriber number agnostic when it comes to YouTube, and not with the smaller guys, and then gradually work up. In terms of it being about who you know, that's the only one I'm going to kind of half agree with, but not in the cynical way that that's framed. It is about how good the game is, without question. But Everybody that knows somebody used to not know somebody. It's all about relationship building. PR and promotional stuff has always been about that, and it always will be. So it's important that you get yourself out there early and build those relationships. And as Pierre was saying, don't be afraid to, you know, to network and meet people. You've got loads of journalists and PR people here today. Get advice from them. But take advantage of the opportunity. And in terms of in terms of luck, I'm a big believer that you kind of that you make your own luck, but more importantly, that you make your own opportunities people have lucky serendipitous things happen to them but actually unless you've got an idea of what you want to achieve and where you want to go then when those lucky things happen you're not in a position to be able to take advantage of them so I think anybody that's that's very successful gets more lucky the more the more work that they put in so there is so much stuff that you can do these days as an indie um, it's you know more democratizing than ever the ability to be able to reach straight to your potential players but actually where do you get started especially if you're, you're short-handed how do you actually see the wood for the trees well like anything in life it's all about planning um, you need to decide right from the beginning what you want to achieve what is what how is success dis defined for you out of this exercise it may be simply down to you have to sell x number of games in order to make x amount of money in order to keep going it might be that simple it might be a very money driven thing but for a lot of people success is defined in different ways it may be that actually all you need to achieve in this first is understanding how to get a game onto a new marketplace or understanding how to work with a publisher so think the next most important thing you need to do is actually think about what's possible what skills do you have? And more importantly, what skills do you not have? Um, you really need to know what you don't know. Think about what you have in your team, what advice you can access from other people, who you can add to the team to do that, whether that's employing other people, joining forces with other indies, hiring agencies or consultants, it doesn't matter. The important thing is that you need to know where you're going, what you want to achieve and what skills that you don't have. If any of you have been ever worked in larger studios or been involved with recruitment processes, you'll know that it's kind of it's never it's never about um, able to, knowing how to do somebody's job. It's always about understanding what they need in order to do their job. So when you're recruiting somebody or talking to somebody to be a consultant, you need to have an idea of what you need them to do. You need to be able to ask the right questions, and then you need to be able to brief and manage them. Um, so make sure you inform yourself on these things that that you're perhaps a little bit weak on. So once you've sorted that out and you've got some support in, you need to work out how you're going to position yourself. So you need to work out where you fit in the market and your studio offering that other people aren't. What stuff are you offering that other people already are? Because that's important to know as well. Um, make sure you know what to be remembered for and respected for. And then make sure you can communicate that really clearly and really succinctly. And then be consistent with doing that right through the process. <coughs> 
you need to then establish a presence for yourself online or no one's going to know who you are or what you stand for. Um, that could just be a really basic website at first. Um, for those of you that haven't already checked out um, Vlambeer's Do Press Kit, I suggest you do. That's a super useful tool. And actually, if you're struggling with the positioning bit before that, then Do Press Kit is a useful kind of template because it makes you ask the right questions about yourself and about what you stand for. Also have a think about when you're putting a website together, make it extensible, have a think about what you might want to use it for later. You don't have to plan out the next five years worth of your website content, but think about things like, do you think you're going to want to, want to add a forum later? Are you going to want to have to take payments at some point? Just make sure that what you're doing at the beginning is going to allow you to, to do that without having to reinvent the wheel. Um, social media, obviously super important. If you haven't already got a Twitter account set up, now's the time to do it. Um, it's by far the best way to build those relationships we talked about, get to know people, journalists, other developers, other people that might be able to help you and support you along the way. Um, think carefully about things like a Facebook page for your game. Maybe your game doesn't actually need it. Don't just create something because other people are creating it. Um, think about what you've got the resources, what you actually need and what you've got the resources to maintain. Because having a poorly maintained social channel is arguably worse than not having one at all. But think about some of the other things that you can do as well. Twitch has been an absolute cornerstone of our community building um, for um, Terratech. The, the guys there have streamed pretty much every day, every weekday for the last year, and multiple times on some days. They've built it in root and branch to the, the process of developing the game, and it's been invaluable for getting feedback from players, finding out what people are doing with the game, and helping showcase the cool stuff that they're making. Likewise, IndieDB has been really useful for us at Terratech right from the beginning. Um, they're a really, really good community. If you're working on a PC or Mac or, or Linux even game, um, they're a really great community who get really excited about playing stuff super early. Um, and because they're all used to playing stuff super early, they, they're used to kind of ignoring it, the, the old bug and they, they get the fact that it's going to get polished later. Um, but they're a really passionate community and we got a lot, of, a lot of really positive feedback from them and we were able to migrate them to other channels later as well. Um, don't underestimate some of the newer channels as well. I'm at, at Radiant Worlds with Sky Saga, obviously we've got a, a slightly bigger team um, involved there. We've got 10 or 12 people in the, the kind of marketing and live ops side of things, so we've got more hands on deck. Um, but even so, those are things that you can, you can consider even on a smaller team. So we've just started Instagram and Snapchat activity for them, for instance, and that's been really interesting to experiment with that. Um, likewise, direct mail stuff as well, don't know that. And keep your eyes open for some of the new stuff that's coming up. Things like Meerkat and Periscope have only been around five minutes, but people are already doing quite cool things with them, and it would be it's a good experience to kind of get yourself out there in different ways. set up and you know what you're going to be talking about you need to start sharing stuff and the most important thing to share is actually your passion passion for what you're working on and passion for the things that you care about be transparent be genuine be authentic at all times one of the kind of go-to examples i always give is is mike bithel i know he's kind of like indie pr example 101 but i remember mike when he was a not yet graduated game designer that came to one of the student open days at blitz and when he first started at blitz he was one of the first people i knew that was really active on twitter um, I, don't, I think he'd be the first one to admit that he didn't really have a strategy or a plan of how he was going to do anything with any of that. Um, but he's gone on and, and really kind of ridden the wave of that. And I think what the reason why Twitter worked really well for him is that he was really authentic and open. He shared the journey with people. He brought everybody along with him for the ride. So when it got to the point where he wanted to move, Thomas was alone from being a, a, you know, a fun little game jam project into something commercial. He already had a ton of people there behind him who were vested in wanting to see him successful and were happy to kind of evangelise for him. The other really important thing, I think, is to be passionate about, passionate about things that aren't yours as well. I always advise this kind of third, third, third split of people with stuff on Twitter in particular. Um, so only a third of what you do really should be broadcasting, should be kind of talking about your stuff or, or kind of telling people what you're about to release. Another third of it should just be talking to people, building those relationships we talked about. Um, answering questions, asking questions, asking for advice and giving it in return, getting to know people, talking about shared interests. This is how we build up relationships in, in real life. It works just the same on Twitter. And then the final third should be amplifying other people's stuff, sharing cool things other people are doing. The cross-promotional benefit of that sort of collaboration you get between indie developers is super useful. And again, with Terratech, we've done tons of that. Um, every Friday, or most Fridays um, on the live stream, we tend to have a guest on and play another indies game. Um, and that's been a really, really useful tool for us. And that kind of karma builds, works in both directions and is a really cool thing to get involved with. But you can't just survive on chatting about stuff. You actually need to produce some content as well. So you need to make sure that that content 
is varied and interesting and useful and informative to people. Make sure you do a mix of visual and written content. Um, and also really try and aim for maximum reuse and repurposing of things too. I always advise all indies to kind of challenge them to never create a piece of content that they're only going to use once. There's no point spending two days creating an amazing bit of concept art that like, you use for one purpose. That's a waste of your time when your time is so precious. So have a think about it. if you have to create, you know, say, an amazing bit of, bit of artwork for a publisher pitch document, can you maybe turn that into the cover image on your Facebook page? Can you use it to illustrate a blog the following week? Can you push it out on Wednesday evening on the Indie Dev Hour hashtag on Twitter? There's lots of things that you can, if you're clever about it, that you can reuse things for, and then you're getting maximum, maximum bang for buck. Because at the end of the day, what you're actually creating is a content marketing plan, which probably is the kind of phrase that makes most of you roll your eyes, and it's not the sort of thing that you really wanted to create when you became an indie developer. But actually, that's what you're doing, and that's the kind of stuff that's going to get people interested in your story. But make sure that that content plan is tied really closely to your development plan as well. There's no point crippling yourself and creating a whole load of stuff that you're not planning to put into the game for six months. That's just silly. Make sure you know the order of the stuff that you're doing in the game and then plan your, your promotional stuff around that. Again, any of you that have been big developers have probably all, you know, all had at least one experience where you've got a random email from a publisher's marketing department overnight that's demanding 40 screenshots in 24 hours and you didn't know about them. Well, the best bit about being an indie is you don't have to deal with that rubbish, right? So you can plan yourself and you can make sure that you know, you're planning ahead and you're making best, best use of the stuff that you're already doing. The great thing with that, of course, tying it into your development plan is that it becomes really easy to show tangible progress to all your followers all the time. If you're getting into a cycle of sharing all the stuff that you're doing, um, then it's a, it's a really believable story and people can see that journey that you're taking and the progress that you're making. Again, Twitch is super useful for this and it can be it can be something that and I think for a lot of people they find it a bit daunting. You don't have to kind of sit on camera and do this kind of super polished show. Um, a lot of the a lot of the streaming the guys do during the day for TerraTech um, is through the game development channel on Twitch, which is really, really useful and gets you a whole load of kind of extra eyeballs that wouldn't normally be following your game. And we hook up the um, the live stream system to one of the artists or the animators or one of the coders and they literally just they don't even narrate it, they just you just Street live stream what they're doing and loads of people are really interested in that kind of thing. So think about ways that you can do without impacting the work you're doing on the game. But it's not about just broadcasting news and sharing stuff with people like that. It's really important to get out in the public eye as well and actually get let people get their hands on your stuff early. So that might be the demos on IndieDB for instance. Um, and as I say that worked really well for Terratech but also going to events and shows has been super useful for us. We must have done 12, 15 shows in the last 18 months and they've all been incredibly useful and they've all brought something to light that we hadn't noticed before without, that you just don't get you know, from not watching people play the game. The first time we took the, the game to a public show was at Res last year at the NEC um, and the guys had recently, so it's all about building modular vehicles with like little Lego parts that you snap together and they all have different powers and abilities um, and the guys had just put on some um, rocket booster blocks and they were designed to, to be put on to face backwards to just create extra speed on the flat. Um, but within a couple of hours of the show opening, somebody rotated them, pointed them down to the ground and fired themselves up in the air. Because the whole game's based on a realistic physics engine, it was like, okay, wow, well, now we've got rockets. And it's un unbelievable for the team that they don't know why they didn't think that people were going to do that. But we saw it happen. Russ, the um, founder and lead coder, went home that night, coded in a flying challenge mode brought it back in the next day and we had people playing for hours and coming back time and time again to just get involved in that. We've now got a whole feature set in there that's based on flying vehicles with wings and propellers and the whole thing. And that, and maybe that's something that we might have come up with and the team might have come up with as they went through development on the game, but it was stemmed from something that happened at a show with the community playing it. And the fact that we could then feed that back and show that we were reacting immediately to people engaging with the game is a really powerful story in itself. The other thing is don't be afraid to show press early. There's lots of press here. If you've got games with you, please show them. Um, most experienced journalists, and certainly everybody that's here today, is again, like the IndieDB crowd, they're used to seeing things that are rough around the edges. They know things that will be improved. They're not going to judge you for that. Um, I think it's... I, get, I always get really frustrated when people try to be over secretive with stuff and I've had it I've had it a few times when we've done the one-to-ones here actually if anyone is planning on sitting down with me at least I can't speak for everybody else but if anyone's planning on sitting down with me at a one-to-one -one later and your opening line is going to be I can't tell you about my game yet because it's still secret and it's not finished 
don't come and sit down. The, re the reality is, <laughs> the reality is, is that none of us here have the time, the inclination, or frankly the skill to rip off your game idea. But what we do have is a ton of experience and a ton of useful feedback that we can give you. So take advantage of those opportunities, not just here, but at other events as well. Um, the Rami from um, Vlambeer talks quite a lot about this and about the idea of um, the experiences they had when they had ridiculous fishing cloned. And even he says that actually getting out there early and having shown other people just helped their case that they'd been doing it first. So you've got nothing to be lost by doing that. The same is true with, you know, with YouTubers and stuff too. Like I said, you have to start reaching out early. You need to build these relationships early. Um, and some of the, the very small channels that we engaged with kind of six, nine months ago on YouTube for TerraTech, um, they were perhaps growing channels. We allowed them to, to stream the game, to monetize it, to do whatever they wanted with it. Um, and because the game happened to be popular with some of their, their viewers, their channels themselves have grown as a result of doing a series on TerraTech. So they're now more than happy to come back to us and ask how they can help us move to the next level as well. So all of that stuff, all that karma comes back and helps you. So. The important thing to know with all this is that it all seems a bit daunting and there's all a million things you can be doing and you don't know where to start. But the thing is that this stuff takes practice. You're not going to be an expert at this at the beginning. Mistakes happen, that's okay. We all make mistakes as well, even though we've been doing it for years. But you need to make sure that you, you get cracking on these things and you have a go at stuff and just experiment. The things that make you a really good developer, that ability to think creatively, to think about how to engage people, that tenacity to keep trying new things and experimenting, that's all the same abilities that make a good PR as well. So just practice with stuff and experiment. It's much better to make mistakes early than it is later. It's much less costly. Then finally, pudding, because it was another word that began with P. So, you know, alliteration is good. Um, and yes, the proof of the pudding will be in the results that you get if you, if you try some of this. <laughs> Symbol crash. Somebody, um, if you, thank you. <laughs> so so if, you, you know, if you try some of this stuff and you experiment with it, you will see results. You will genuinely see results and it's really worth getting stuck into. So whether, you know, whether you're trying to mobilize your community to support you on Kickstarter or back your green light campaign or just buy the finished game, um, all that groundwork that you've done to build that passionate community out of nothing will be worth its weight in gold. So if you want your story to be, hold, to be heard, rather, you have to make sure that somebody is listening. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Do we have time for questions? About five minutes. Any questions? Or well, we can wait till the panel later. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Some things are going to be more suited for streaming or for YouTubers than uh, others. I mean, in terms of like timing, because I've been, well, I've talked to a few people who, who recommend leaving Twitch until literally like maximum two weeks before launch, and then preferably at launch, so you don't get like Twitch streamers burnt out on your game before it's even. I think, I think if you're approaching third party streamers, there's an argument for that, again, depending on the kind of game that you're working on and what kind of build-up you want. In terms of streaming yourself, though, I'd argue do it as early as possible and get oh, people yes, engaged yeah, with yeah, them. Yeah, but yeah, approaching other people, you need to be careful with the timing, yeah. But for YouTube, you, you think it's a different ballgame? Like, I, th I think it is. I think you can get away with stuff earlier with YouTube than you can with Twitch at the minute. That's probably just more to do with the maturity of the channel and the kind of games that are being covered on it at the moment. Like, but Exactly, it's a very kind of performative, um, yeah. creative kind of free type game, and yes, and that does lend itself a lot more. Um, and yeah, and a lot of the stuff we've done wouldn't suit a different type of game. It's true, um, but I think you need to what you need to do when you're when you're doing that kind of positioning discussion at the beginning really is have a look at the other kind of games that are in your sort of space, see what they're doing, see what YouTubers and Twitchers are covering that kind of game and are liking it, and then you can add them to your list and then pick pick the right time to reach out to them. Should we stop? <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Sure.